Good evening. Um, I'd like to call the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Stockbridge meeting for January 27th, 2022 to order. Uh, first on our agenda this evening, we have um, Van Kakoyanakis, I hope I pronounced your name right, from VH yes. with us, <laughs> <laughs> to give us an overview of the um, the red line and intersection and the traffic on Main Street and how we're going to be addressing um, that project. So are you ready to start a presentation, Van? Yes, I am. Let me just uh, share my screen. Do you need sharing? No. Okay. okay. Can you guys see that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who do, do we have people from the public? Have we have. Do we have many? I see. Uh, one, two, three, four, five people out. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like me to start? Yes, please go right ahead. So I'm going to be going over um, the intersection of South and Pine Streets at Main Street, and along with some other improvements along Main Street in the general vicinity. Um, the purpose of this virtual informational meeting um, is, is to review the preliminary plans, which include uh, the intersection of South and Pine Streets at Main Street, uh, crosswalk, crosswalk removal along Main Street, uh, relocating the crosswalk going across Main Street at the intersection of Elm Street, and providing a raised crosswalk in front of the town hall. Work completed to date, we reviewed crash data, uh, perform, performed a field survey, developed concepts, um, had a previous virtual uh, meeting, which we identified alternatives, uh, and we took one of the preferred or preferred alternative and we actually um, constructed in the field uh, utilizing painting. And uh, we also included the preliminary plans for the intersection of South and Pine Streets at Main Street. So today, um, just you know, a brief overview. Uh, about a year and a half ago, um, paintings were were painted within the intersection, which include a painted island and it, uh, curb extensions, as well as bike bike lanes um, connecting Main Street through the intersection. And here's some photos of those markings uh, in the field. Uh, the project moving forward for preliminary design, uh, there are intersection improvements at South and Pine at Main, uh, removing a crosswalk just east of the intersection. Uh, the crosswalk going across Main Street at the intersection of Elm Street will be be moved to the west, and we're installing a raised crosswalk in front of the town hall. So the improvements at South and Pine Streets at Main Street uh, intersection. Um, there's going to be traffic calming. We're trying to narrow the pavement, extend some of the curbing. And in order to extend and narrow the intersection, we're having mountable pavement, which um, we really can't extend the curb any further because there's a lot of trucks that turn through the intersection. Um, this will allow the trucks to mount these areas, but in return, it, it creates a more defined um, area for the vehicles to move throughout. Mm -hmm. All the crosswalks um, and pedestrian curb ramps will be updated. Uh, there will be an, a, an additional crosswalk on the, on the uh, east side of I'm sorry, the west side of the intersection, mm -hmm. um, providing bike lanes through um, through the intersection. There was going. Uh, there's an improved lighting option 
And like I mentioned, we're removing the crosswalk east of the intersection. So here's a, the preliminary plan. Um, bump out here on this corner. That's the northwest corner. So the crosswalk that's proposed is shorter than crossing the entire length of Main Street. Uh, we bumped out the southwest corner as well, providing new ramps at these locations. The crosswalks going across South Street and Pine Streets will remain in the same locations, but the ramps will be, the pedestrian curb ramps will be updated to the latest ADA standards. The crosswalk uh, along on the east side of South Street and Pine Street um, is here is shown. Again, we're bumping out the, the curb, so the distance is shorter, but um, we are currently looking at making this a raised crosswalk to include um, more of a traffic, more traffic calming in the, at the intersection. Um, and to date right now, we, we think this is uh, feasible and this work can be done. There are curb extensions along in front of um, the Red Lion Inn and also across the street, there's a curb extension here. The curb is being extended at the islands on both sides of, of Main Street on Pine Street and also South Street. And these hatched areas are further extensions, but um, this will be mountable for trucks on both sides and the center island as well will be mountable. The crosswalk uh, east of the intersection will be removed. It currently today, um, it connects to a driveway uh, and it's not ADA accessible. Improvements at the crosswalks along Main Street. Um, here are the two locations. Like I said, we're shifting the crosswalk at Elm Street to move out of the driveway and the curb ramps, uh, pedestrian curb ramps will be updated um, at the town hall, the crosswalk is also going to have um, updated pedestrian curb ramps and it's the cr uh, crosswalk will be raised. Um, when I'm referring to pedestrian curb ramps being updated, they're gonna meet the latest ADA standards and they'll have detectable warning strips. This is just a, um, the preliminary plan for the two crosswalks I'm referring to. The existing crosswalk was here, uh, it's moving over approximately about 15 feet in order to, um, so it's not entering a driveway and it'll have, like I mentioned, ADA accessible ramps. In front of the town hall, the crosswalk, again, ADA accessible pedestrian curb ramps will be constructed and the crosswalk will be raised. Uh, just here are some pictures of the existing crosswalks, the crosswalk at Main Street, east of Pine and South Street. As you can see here, it is entering a driveway. And then at Elm Street, it's doing the same thing, the crosswalks entering a driveway. Uh, this is just a, a photo of the existing crosswalk at the town hall where the pedestrian curb ramps don't have detectable warning panels. And then just to give an overall view of the project, this is um, the existing condition. This is what it's uh, going to be looking like in the future. Uh, you can see how the roadways are bumped out. There's areas for landscaping on each of the corners and the landscaping can be um, provided in the curb extensions. Uh, the plantings will need to be um, at a lower level, so we're not um, creating any site distance issues. Uh, these are the mountable pavement areas. And then looking at it from an intersection standpoint, and I'll, I'll play this again, um, the new crosswalks with the uh, pedestrian curb, curb ramps, plantings in the area, an optional lighting, uh, plantings again, here are the mountable 
uh, pavement areas. And I'll just, um, just so I can, I want to just hit play. Got to go back a slide. So that's what's today. And, and these were the changes that would happen. Uh, for lighting option, at this point in time, um, these are about 22 feet in, in height. They provide uh, lighting for both the road and the and the sidewalks. Um, and there's also options to put lights on the back of the poles, which would provide even more lighting for the the pedestrian walkways. Uh, project costs, as it's broken down, um, the improvements to South and Pine Streets at Main Street with the crosswalk improvements along Main Street is $639,000. The lighting option is $321,000 and including an additional race crosswalk at, at the intersection of South and Pine on the east side is roughly $35,000 and that's um, to ensure uh, that the roadway will drain properly, um, placing the race crosswalk in that area. Uh, totals just under a million dollars. And if anyone has any questions. I any like it. Yeah, I do too. I'm, go okay, go ahead. Um, Ben, great, great presentation. Um, question. Um, I, I just want to uh, uh, reiterate and have you, you know, uh, speak to how much of this project really is uh, about ADA compliance, which I believe the town has a responsibility to make progress on. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, one might come away from the presentation thinking this was just a cosmetic improvement, whereas, in fact, we have to show you know, progress on, you know, American with Disabilities Act compliance in order to, you know, avoid, I mean, you can talk to him more, Michael, but I just want to make sure people understand that there is a practical benefit to the project as well. Yeah, um, you know, all the, all the pedestrian curb ramps, as mentioned, um, within the project limits are, are going to be upgraded. So um, this photo here, mm -hmm. And this is just a good example, and I can go back to uh, another, some other photos. But um, this this curb ramp here is it's just an extension of the sidewalk, and it doesn't meet ADA compliance because it, it doesn't have a detectable warning panel. And the dec detectable warning panel allows the um, the the, per the person to understand that. Uh, once they hit the detectable warning panel that they're they're entering a street um, all the ramps that we're also providing um, are entering entering the roads at a perpendicular um, crossing point so in other words we're we're not having any apex ramps which lead uh, pedestrians into the intersection at an angle um, where they're not entering the crosswalk at a perpendicular um, movement. So it's kind of confusing on which way they, they should be heading. I'm just gonna go to um, a few other pictures. Right. And while he's doing that, Michael, what's the implication if we don't make progress on ADA? So obviously your main issue is whether or not you ever receive an ADA complaint, and then you have to have what are called transition plans and a self-evaluation. Last year, we completed our transition plan and self-evaluation, which identified deficiencies around the town in terms of ADA, which included Main Street, right. crosswalks and the rest. Right. What we should be doing is we are supposed to be showing progress as we move forward. So as we begin design and other things into these projects, we need to be looking at how to comply with ADA. Right. And do you, in your opinion, does this show progress? Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand. I just want to make sure that the viewers, you know, and, um, if we ever get any, understand. I have a question also, because I know that there's been some discussion that um, possibly there's a, an, an avenue um, for funding part of this, which would be 
the main street corridor itself, not just not the intersection, but the crosswalks and possible lighting, additional lighting mm -hmm. um, that could be covered. And if you want to maybe speak to that grant possibility. Yeah, there is a shared street grant, which last year came out and we got it in 15,200, but they now have a project up to 200,000, which includes safety, ADA compliance and um, traffic calming, which all this, including the raised sidewalk, the crosswalks and the rest do it. So Van was able to present, uh, split out the project and that work up in there uh, without the light, uh, just the crosswalk fix is about 163,000 and we can do up to 200,000. So that application, plus you wanna leave some contingencies. So we're, right now this gets us where we could look and I am gonna file for um, the crosswalk improvement through the shared street program. Okay. And that's um, our first. If I could add to that, Michael, the um, those two crosswalks, I did include conduit for lighting, oh, so right. that so the road wouldn't be, you know, if you were to put that in and then you wanted to put in lighting later, um, you don't have to rip up the road after you've done that construction. So great, that's, great that's actually that's actually included. Thank so you. The, the conduit and the handholds would be there in place, um, so you wouldn't have to go back. Right. Perfect. And if, uh, can you address how and if uh, it may not even be necessary based on prior improvements we've made, but with the increased severity of storms, have we taken into account potential uh, flooding events, you know, rain events that we, you know, might anticipate as being a 100 or 500 year event, but which seem to be happening with increased frequency? Like, is there any concurrent work we should be thinking about related to you know, rain events that while we're doing this construction, we should be thinking about? Um, well, this is this is kind of a like this work that's being done. This is um, it's not uh, we're not adding any impervious area. We're actually um, kind of including a little bit more um, not impervious area with these uh, bump outs uh being landscape so we you know the drainage improvements here are minor um it's just adjusting catch basins one thing that we did look at and this really isn't answering your question um because uh as a whole this we're we're really not impacting any of the impervious area here um it's pretty much staying the same but what we did look at is, uh, if you could see my cursor, this crosswalk um, is being looked at as being raised and we just adjusted it, uh, the drainage, or we're doing that now, we're adjusting the drainage in this area to include um, additional catch basins so that we don't create any drainage issues out there um, as an example, puddling or ponding. Um, but from the standpoint that you're requesting, um, it's, there's a possibility to create some of these landscape areas and, um, create almost like, um, infiltration areas to, right. to, um, to include or help out with some of those rainfall events. But, uh, to date that isn't planned for but with some of these areas there there is that possible opportunity what do you think of is that an issue for us or uh, not within the this scope project. of this project um you know but if we're digging um, it up anyway raised um because once you get in the subsurface and the rest yeah you're dealing with quite a bit right. so Okay. I don't know. Maybe you don't remember. Maybe you were away at college. When <laughs> do you remember, Chuck, when Main Street used to flood severely? Yeah. So I mean, it used to be. Yeah. We would get it up to right. up the curb, but so they took care of that many years ago. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just making sure. But it, there is definitely um, less impervious area out here. Um, so that that's going to help out a little bit, but not significantly. All right. And do you have the breakout of um, 
as Mike addressed, you know, doing the shared streets um, to fund some of this. Do you have that breakout on a slide? Uh, if you, Van, if you just go to the price slide. Let's go back to the yeah. price. So the 639, we can remove 163 to go toward the grant mm -hmm. um, for the shared street, which then would leave the difference there. So you're down to 400 and something if we were able to get that. Right. And then you have to examine whether or not we want to do the lighting option, which is optional. So, right. And On we, the other we hand, know that that's substantial, but it's, yeah. We know it's substantial, but we also know that we have, um, you know, inadequate lighting mm -hmm. in the evening mm -hmm. yeah. on that section of main street so i think it's well worth it if we're going to be doing this project um do it and make it attractive and then it serves that purpose that and would, hopefully would they can also be um, controlled mm -hmm. yeah. so that's a question for van so these could be set up the lighting option could be set up to be controlled how do you mean how do you mean controlled uh, yeah, demo and, and actually van the answer would be yes because we'd be putting in led light bulbs Oh, yes. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah so th this would all be LED lighting. Um, let me just go over where those uh, lights would be. And I'm just going to go back to the, sorry about that. So right now, this is a, a lighting concept. Um, so we're proposing uh, a light here, here. Oops. Mean to, I gotta be very careful with this mouse. Uh, here, here, across the way here, and here. Uh, and then there'd be one on each side for these other two crosswalks. So there's about eight, eight lights, um, light standards at the intersection and there's additional four at the other two. So that price includes all the lighting? That price includes um, the lighting, the lighting fixtures, the poles, the foundations, the conduit, handholes, and um, um, I'm assuming this section here would be on one load center and the intersection would be on its own load center. Mm -hmm. And so, and those lights would be um, metered and owned by the town. So that, unlike the other ones that are right. underground and owned by a national grid, right? But we'd only own to the um, to the stations, the metering stations. So, but, but we're comfortable because obviously it's going to be the wiring's underground. It's, it's all going to be brand new oh. from the pole. Yeah, okay. Okay. You got answers for everything. Yeah. All right. <laughs> He's good. Uh, no, I think well, it's a, the uh, other day on lighting. Yeah. <laughs> and, no, I think it's yeah. a uh, very good project. I think it's a needed project, and I would, you know, just push forward with it and do the lighting and everything, get it done. I agree. I think we just uh, need to put it on the warrant. Yep. A little for a motion. Make a motion. We. Uh, do the work necessary to get this on the warrant. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Six Good job, four. Van. Thanks. Yeah, yeah excellent hey, job. Hey, Van, you know that the, the pretty picture of yes. what it's going to look like in the future? Is there any way we could get that on like a poster size mm -hmm. so that we could display that? I don't see why not. Um, yeah, we can. I could have that mounted and sent to you. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just make sure we're talking the same photo. That's all. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm sharing my <laughs> screen again. The one with nice flowers. Are you talking that, about that this one. here? Well, when not it, that one. Transitions, <laughs> right? Yeah, the trans, you? the pretty transition that right one. there. That. Okay, you that, want this on? Yeah. The other one that would be helpful is go back a couple where you have this the overhead view of the whole street. Yeah. That one. Yep. Yeah. I think those two would be very helpful to illustrate to people this is what we're doing and this is what it's going to look like. Yeah, I can have these sent to you. Um,
just it has to go to our Watertown office. They have to print it um, yeah. and mail it out. But uh, just a couple of weeks and you should have it. Okay. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, great job. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Do we have any questions from the public for Van or for us on this topic? Any hands up? I don't see any hands, but we do have Brent, it looks like. Yes. Uh, sorry, I just have a question about um, uh, when people unfamiliar with the town enter the um, intersection, they frequently don't understand intuitively that it's a three-way stop and not a four-way stop. Has anything ever been thought about uh, how that might be made clear to people? Um, because that seems to me to be the principal hazard of that intersection in my personal experience. Um, sometimes people think when they have the right way, they don't, so they hesitate and nobody knows what to do because they're afraid to move out into the intersection because the person with the right of way might all of a sudden realize I have the right of way and charge ahead. Um, so in, any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, that has been discussed. And that third stop sign was added quite some time ago now. And I believe the rationale, and Chuck, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the rationale behind that was to keep the flow of traffic moving, the major traffic flow, which is north to south, you know, south to north, so Route 7. Um, so that means when you're coming from uh, West Main Street, you have to make that stop. And it would be a right-hand turn to go south on 7 there. Um, so that was put in quite some time ago. It's been discussed and, you know, that ball's been tossed around for a long time. Um, but what we did do is we did add a little yellow information signs that says it's a three-way stop underneath the stop signs um, that exist there. I believe they're on all three. Yeah, okay. I, believe, I believe all three stop signs say three-way stop. Um, unfortunately, the fourth leg, you, you can't really, uh, there's no MUTCD regulated sign that says this is not a stop. Right. Um, <laughs> and I'm not trying to be facetious there. I'm, um, I understand what, what you're referring to, so it, it can be confusing. Um, hopefully the you know the the race crosswalk will slow down vehicles entering um from that direction but there's uh there's really no appropriate sign for that one leg to uh, to add there to to help out the situation um and as mentioned like the the other three stop signs do say uh, three-way. Right. Um, and when we first adopted this plan to, as a test and did the line, the painting and reducing um, the size of that intersection and uh, trying to better guide people through the intersection, um, it was done as a test. And so we do have the statistics uh, for that intersection for the last two years, and we do see a significant improvement. We were averaging, and it wasn't a huge problem, but we were averaging about, um, I say prior to 2019 or so, we were doing about seven um, accidents per year in that intersection. And 2020 and in 2021, we've only had four. And basically the four for 2021, Failure, failure to yield right of way, <laughs> failure to stop. And then one that was caused by a medical issue. Someone was ill and it created an accident. So we don't have a huge number of incidents there. And yes, sometimes it can be confusing, but I think anytime that someone is traveling in an unfamiliar area, it can be very confusing. Um, I think most local people understand exactly what's going on at that intersection. So the majority of our 
you know, traffic during the year. It's probably commuters that are yeah. local. And I believe putting, you know, paying the lines people drive over, but these pump outs and stuff is going to be more pronounced. And I think it would be a little more sensible when you get to it, of where you're going and who has it right away. Yeah, because people aren't, done. That, that's the whole point, is that this has been a pretty good test, but people do, you know, do make improper turns and they do drive over those lines. But once it's raised, you know, nobody is really going to want to do that. That's an unpleasant experience. And it's like if you've ever hit the rumble strip on the turnpike, you know, it's it would be unpleasant to go over that. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Thank you very much, Van. Good presentation. Thank you. You guys have a nice evening. You too. Take care. Okay, next on the agenda, Culvert Grant Program, the MVP grant. Allison Dixon is with us. Allison, you can come up and identify yourself. Sure. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Allison Dixon. I work for the Housatonic Valley Association. Our office is here in town. I'm the Berkshire Watershed Conservation Manager. And I am here today to speak about uh, the Lennox Municipal Vulnerability Planning Action, Regional Action Grant that we are a part of, and so is Stockbridge. And uh, the project is called Housatonic Extreme Restoration for Regional Flood Resilience Project. Long, long name. Basically, uh, Housatonic Valley Association is the watershed organization, and we have been doing road stream crossing management plans for a long time. And this is, I did not do a write a spiel, so I'm forgetting what comes next. So you might just. Um, <laughs> uh, this regional action grant has multiple partners and participating communities. Uh, the town of Lennox, uh, New Marlborough and town of Stockbridge and the city of Pittsfield there were three participating communities along with multiple um, organizations um, as you can see there Berkshire Regional Planning Commission they're kind of the umbrella the administrative umbrella Mass Audubon it is the key educator HBA is also doing education with um, that there is a grant that we're involved with. So that is actually a bit of a match for this grant as there is a required 25% match. Uh, Trout Unlimited, we work partner with them on doing this kind of work and they are going to be helping uh, in an additional capacity. And Greenagers, in, if you're familiar with them, they um, employ youth for uh, doing conservation work. So this is a, a step in that direction to some different kind of work where the youth are going to be doing the assessments of the culverts. Um, and University of Connecticut, they're involved with helping with the, they do the flood risk analysis. So if we go to the next page, slide, that's just our watershed. And this um, project is, of course, up in the Berkshire County region. If we go to the next slide. Um, we are all familiar with how climate change is impacting us, and we're seeing more rain. And this can be a result at a road stream crossing. So everywhere you have a road crossing over a stream, you've got some kind of infrastructure underneath, a pipe. Um, it could be a bridge whatever, and um, the increased precipitation events have been known to blow them out completely uh, or cause severe erosion. And the other, next slide, um, it's not all, only an impact to um, the infrastructure. Uh, we want to have some connectivity under these roads so that our cold water species such as the native brook trout can find refuge upstream if they they need to often need to move from warmer streams up and find colder streams and especially as we're seeing our changing climate higher temperatures this is going to become important so this work 
furthers the watershed goals, but also the goal is to provide greater climate resilience to the towns and the communities. Next slide. Um, and the outcomes of this project. So we are going to be identifying potential products, projects that build climate resilience and that we can seek um, funding for. There is outreach and education that focuses on what climate change is, what is climate resilience, how can we move towards that. Um, we'll be doing that through school programs, we'll be doing landowner outreach, and we'll be doing also um, tabling events, displays um, with our multiple partners. It's not all HBA, but the ultimate outcome, and I have meant to bring an example, uh, the road stream crossing management plan for each town includes an inventory of all the road stream crossings, an assessment of those crossings, uh, how they fare in different levels of storms, uh, 2, 5, 25, 50, all the way up 100 year storms. And we'll be meeting with key town people to get town input into which crossings have been an issue and looking at prioritizing replacement. So you have a plan going forward on which crossings are most in need of replacement, whether it's they're beginning to fail, whether they're likely to overtop, um, or um, they just are a, a, a barrier as well and will afford you some better climate resilience. So next slide. Um, these roads, stream um, crossing management plans have a bunch of components. And the difference with this regional action grant is um, you can see under number one, that's where Green Agers comes in. They are gonna be recruiting youth and we've already started that process this fall. We use Stockbridge as a training ground and we had an incredible crew and they were out there. We met some landowners too. And they will begin again in April and May, April and May time, should be beginning in April to continue the work we expect to finish Stockbridge this spring. And then all that information will go to UCOM to for their flood risk modeling so they can see which crossings might overtop during a storm. And an additional thing we are going to be looking at since we have crews out there. Where does it make sense? Where is there a lot of stormwater input? Does it, if that culvert got replaced, does it make sense to infiltrate that? Is there a lot of road sediment getting into that stream? Is there erosion upstream? Is there potential for greater flood storage? So we are gonna be looking at, and that's the nature-based solutions, gathering some information in the field and Trout Unlimited will be doing something called LIDAR analysis which will help identify these potential future projects to build greater climate resilience into the town of Stockbridge and the other communities. And as I mentioned, we'll be doing some prioritization work with the town to really come up with a good plan for the future. Next slide. And the goal really, um, when you replace culverts um, for the fish, you really want them to cross under the road as, and not even realize that they're going under a road. Um, and so generally, uh, there are stream crossing standards in Massachusetts uh, that require replacements, um, provided it's economically feasible to be 1.2 bankful width, so extra width wide um, to allow that extra volume of water to go through so it doesn't act like a dam. Um, it allows the movement of debris through so it doesn't clog and pond. And we did see one culvert, which I know the Stockbridge is already aware of, and actually had a mass PER culvert grant on it, um, where we saw a huge loss clogging at the inlet. Um, and it even allows, it often allows terrestrial passage. So animals, instead of being pushed up over the road, might go under the road and there's less mortality on the road, which can 
um, improve public safety if it's larger animals like deer. And it certainly can help with turtle mortality. And I have seen this one stretch of Route 7 where I think I saw seven dead turtles in one season. Um, so these crossings, they're good for wildlife, and they're also good for people, too. Um, and next slide. So this is kind of the timeline we expect to be, um, we're working out how that nature-based analysis will be done and establishing protocols for the crews to follow. And we've um, been working with uh, Michael on, and the town on outreach and getting the letters ready. We've got uh, spreadsheets. So those letters will go out um, in March to let landowners know that you may see a youth crew crawling around a culvert, um, call it stream troopers, troll patrol. Um, often you have to be on, you have to get onto private property just to do the assessment. And some of these culverts are on private property. So we want to reach out to those landowners to say, hey, we think there's a crossing there. Do you mind? We'd like to come, and when that um, when we do go, when the crew does go there, they knock on the door and um, once again reach out to the landowner. So they should get a letter, and we're also looking at including a fact sheet. And I brought um, this is the fact sheet that we're likely to revise, and I brought copies of it. This is um, HBA's basic fact sheet about our whole the stream crossing management plan process. And uh, um, so, three majors to be continuing field assessments in April and May, May and then the surface modeling will start in June, and that will be um, take a, a, a stretch of time. The outreach and education, this is a two-year grant. It's almost 300,000 um, for the four communities. And um, before the end of the two years, we will have um, sooner for a stop bridge, we'll have a complete road stream crossing management plan. And the hope is that the top priority crossing, that we will be able to garner funding to get you um, that next step forward to get a preliminary design done so that you're at, a, we set the stage to keep that process going and that we can get a crossing replaced for you. Uh, next slide, I think that's about it. This is just an example. Um, we worked with Pittsfield on Churchill Brook. There were two crossings. We worked with them on funding and other aspects. So this was the lower um, crossing on Hancock Road where you can see initially it was two pipes. It was replaced with a bridge. And um, it was amazing. I got to be there when Mass Wildlife did an electroshocking earlier this year and tons and tons of little native brook trout, but they a humongous brook trout. Mm -hmm. And the only way that could have gotten into that stream was that it came up from Anoda Lake. And now that it's a bridge and not those small pipes and perched, you see how it's like a waterfall, that's the outlet. Uh, it's hard for the trout to get up into there. So that movement was very evident with the electrofishing. Um, and just phenomenal to see. So that is the future, and um, they these crossings have been have proven to be um, climate resilience in the face of our increasing larger storms. I think that's it. Next slide. Yeah. Um, if anybody would like more information, uh, we do have a library display that we expect to be arranging to put out in the library with um, some information about this project. And I welcome people to call or email me and ask questions. And I did bring, I think I promised Hugh, I've already met with Hugh because we're looking at providing the information we collect so that it can inform his data layer of where all these culverts are and what they are. So I think I promised him a map that he could have. Um, but this, it might make sense to put one of these somewhere. 
but this this is the initial map. This is the map that the that the field um, crew works with uh, that uh, marks the locations of all the expected crossings. And I met with Hugh to talk about where are there some that aren't on the map, and then the crew when they go out they they're looking for what we call unmapped crossings. And how many, how many mapped crossings do you have so far in Stockbridge? Uh, there's about 70. All right. and I would there's... say 74. I think by the time we're done, the, we'll probably have assessed at least 80. And in your experience in other towns or just as an expert, um, of those 80 stream crossings, how many will require some level of improvement or, or complete redesign? Or I think um, from the work we've done on this fact sheet, I think it indicates that approximately 15%, and we only do the flood risk on the closed bottom, not the right. bridges. Bridges aren't usually tend not to be an issue. However, I think there's a couple in Stockbridge that are very old bridges mm -hmm. that um, I actually had a conversation with my um, colleague, the watershed director, because um, their analysis is different with the open bottom, but I do have concerns that these are, um, look like undersized bridges. So approximately 15%. Right. Um, that's what's typical. Would we need to be replaced or would need to be improved? Would fail in a 25 year flood. So, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and on average, what is the cost to replace a culvert? Oh, uh, so, I'm just I'm making a point yeah. here. I know the answer. Some of the plans, because we're working with uh, about five towns right now Egremont, Richmond, um, mm -hmm. Barrington. I think those uh, preliminary designs are coming out around 200,000. To replace the culvert. Yeah. Okay. So times 12, 15% um, so of 80 yeah. is 12. It can be more. Yeah. Right. Um, the engineer we work with, it, it's, uh, it's the Trout Engineer, Trout Unlimited's engineer that does our designs, and he really works on making and keeping mm -hmm. costs down. As much as possible with his choice of replacement structure. But even even in that scenario, we could be looking at two to three to four million dollars in cost over some time to replace those twenty five year uh, those at risk of a twenty five year. Yeah, event. and it's it's hard to say because that's kind of a an, um, a general number. Yeah, I know, um, but. but yeah, it can, it's an expensive process, and this is, so the MVP action grants, they know that they're, they, they get a lot of um, these kinds of action grants replacement. There are multiple avenues to gain funding mm -hmm. for replacement, so All right. and there's a lot coming down the pipe, too. My understanding is the budget for the MVP action grant this year is 21 mil, 20? 21 million. Good. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Allison from the public? And I, I would like to offer that um, as we go through this and maybe have some progress updates, um, I'm happy to return. And I also talked to Patrick today. I was talking about, you know, I, I thought it would be a good idea to reach out and do a a similar present presentation at the Conservation Commission and just get a sense of right. what has come before them and what concerns they have and how they manage their culvert maintenance, because I'm getting lots of those questions for other towns. So. Um, the only one that has, I'm not sure what the green check mark is, um, it's not a hands up, so I'm not sure, Brent, are you looking to ask a question? Looks like everyone is muted, so. No, no, sorry. I just put that up to say thank you for the answering my last one. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Allison. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was great. to be here in person. <laughs> yeah, it is <laughs> nice. All right. Um, 
Next, we have uh, CPC priorities for the select board for fiscal year 23. Mm -hmm. And Chuck, do you wanna discuss what you think your priorities for CPC would be? Well, we got the August list, right? <laughs> that's not that's nice. the prioritized list, so. This in terms of this, just in terms of CPC funds. How about you, Patrick? I know yep. you always do. So. Oh. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I try to. I know you do. This is one where I'm the rep, so you, you would expect me to, you know, at least have a, a uh, overview. Um, right. uh, actually, Allison's still here, which is great because we were talking about this today too. Um, uh, we've got a plan to apply. We, we've we've done a, an early expression of interest uh, on the Campusa work with the MVP yep. program. There's $21 million, as you said, available. That's for the whole state. These grants are incredibly competitive. So, and we put in three requests. So if we get even one, we're gonna be doing great. But I don't think it's realistic that we'll get, you know, the Ice Glen one and the Forest one and the Campusa one. So, you know, the question is whether um, we want to consider putting in on under the open space bucket, there's open space recreation, there's housing, there's historic preservation. Um, you know, I was thinking that maybe we put in for a 50,000 for a hydrology, hydrology study that's going to cost 100,000. We do a request of 50,000 from CPC. And, you know, if we're going to do that, then we should also match it with a town warrant for 50 grand. And then if we get money from the state, it would obviously reduce what that exposure is. But we're not going to know, uh, you know, before town meeting because those grants won't be announced until uh, over the summer. So, um, you know, uh, uh, so that was one that for us to consider. And I don't know if you want to talk about each one individually or you want to get the, the complete overview and then talk about them. It's up to you. Oh, why don't you give the overview and then All right. we can discuss it. Um, uh, Michael and I have been working with the Agriculture and Forestry Commission, uh, which is, uh, you know, looking to, you know, do a, uh, funding for ice clean treatment for, you know, with the injection rather than spray, it's a more expensive project process, um, uh, possibly a tune of up to $50,000. Once again, um, maybe split that with a match from the town. Um, they also would like to do uh, interpretive sign and trail work uh, where uh, we're really trying to just do like an, an introductory sign when you get into Ice Glen. With some of the storms we had, there are a number of very large trees in Ice Glen that are kind of blocking trails and that are beyond the capability of volunteers to deal with. So getting somebody up there to sort of, especially where they they uh, they uh, uh, block trails, you know, bringing, bringing a professional in, which is, you know, uh, especially in the gorge is pretty, pretty challenging. Um, uh, and, I, and I think Matt's going to come up with some ideas of pricing on that with Michael. Um, Michael and I have talked about uh, the renovation of the Glendale Firehouse as a historic project. Uh, I think that you estimated that was going to be about 75000 And we were thinking about maybe doing a, a half request on CPC and half via warrant item. Um, uh, or, uh, or a different formula if you want, Michael. I, I mean, I, you know. Um, uh, I, I did not come up today at the housing trust fund meeting. However, uh, with the uh, with the you know windfall that we have in CPC this year, um, my personal recommendation is that we we fund the housing trust fund with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's out of the seven hundred thousand that's available. That still leaves more than not more than that. That still leaves a significant amount of funding for um, town and non town projects. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, uh, on Parks and Rec, um, we talked about, uh, you know, some kind of um, a, a, uh, uh, a engineering consultant to figure out how we add senior exercise equipment to Park Street. Michael and I have talked about that a little bit, you know, really trying to come up with a plan this year and then figuring in future years how, to, how we implement it. Um, uh, uh, Roxanne, I'm, I'm thinking that you're going to talk to uh, the engineer that was involved in the beach uh, about what the cost might be to come up with a plan to remove invasives, replant the the, the uh, area uh, by the kayak racks, and add the uh, add the the path down there. Um, this is at the town beach uh, where there's currently fragmites. Um, and then uh, and then there's uh, uh, the question of engineering placement of 
of stones at the Houstonic to make it easier to launch kayaks, similar to what they have in Egremont and up in Williamstown. Mm -hmm. So that is the universe of projects uh, for CPC that, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, uh, yeah. we're, we've been discussing. Yeah. Okay. I well, think the, the parks, I think, need a lot of attention. I do too. Uh, right. I think I got a lot of parks up the steady art playgrounds and parks and recreation and hiking and I think that's been neglected for a long time and I think we really got to invest in parks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the rationale behind, um, you know, funding just half of, of some of these projects? Um, the CPC likes to see a match, you know, uh, where there's where there's uh, there's always obviously many more dollar amounts of requests than what the fund will allow and so by by matching funds you know we we show that the town is committed and and that you know uh uh that we just have a better chance of 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 doing more more of these projects if we have if the price tag of each one is less obviously so right I'm just wondering about the selection of which ones are, are, you know, matching funds and which ones are not. I was just curious what the rationale is behind. I, they all have matching funds. They all do. I mean, I was, I was, that would be my recommendation is that we okay. do a 50 50 split on them all. Okay. Um, Except for thing, maybe the housing trust fund where, where we, if we're going to do a match, let's just increase it even more. Right. I mean, we can also, I believe we can, well, look at those different topics. Right. Then the other thing that, that we've talked about is, um, doing something, asking for some funds to do some kind of a design for historical interpretation. Yes, in fact, and, that was, that's a great. And idea. monuments um, in town, because I think we need to capitalize on our history and we really have nothing in town to indicate, you know, the significant rich history that we have mm -hmm. here. Um, so I think at least to um, get together, maybe a 15 to $20,000 yeah. to, to put together a plan. Uh, to be able to do that, um, right? Uh, I think that's great. So that's I will another that one that us. I would suggest. Uh huh. Good. But yeah, I agree. I mean, it's important. I think it's extremely important that um, mm -hmm. you know we're taking taxpayer dollars as in essence and. We're addressing mm -hmm. yeah. issues that we have in town. And there's a lot of really, uh, you know, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of really creative ways we can uh, we can create, uh, you know, interactions between our history and, and, and visitors and students and whatever, you know, you, you know, uh, scannable QR codes that tie to into a website that tells a story. We could even do that. You know, uh, we could we could do interactive maps of the cemetery that would you know, literally like play an audio clip or, or provide information on key graves in the cemetery. I mean, there's a lot of really creative things we could do that would, you know, help tell an interactive story. You know, and, and in some ways it's very similar to what, you know, uh, what what uh, the uh, AFC wants to do, agriculture and forestry wants to do in terms of the interpretive work at Ice Glen. I mean, really, exactly. really you similar. know, uh, kind of walking interactives right you know, what is right. it called? And we've talked about submersion or that. immersion. Immersion. Yeah, and we've, we're planning somewhere. to do this revolutionary right. war monument. Yeah, and well, we're we, that's what I was bring that up. Where are we staying with that? Did Terrell ever find the stone or we got a stone. We got a stone. <laughs> you need any money for the stone? So I have to yeah, <laughs> I have to do a little more homework on that. So I have to get costing on all right. that. Uh, and I have the, to get uh, what they the want to write. But that's the situation where they can't put all the names. Um, and the intention is not to necessarily name every person, right. um, but they're going to come up with, you know, some kind of an inscription that would be engraved on this stone um, for the Revolutionary War soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing. Yeah, you know, we you could, could access you it and get a list. A QR code where that then links you to the known names that we can you have. chisel a QR code? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Should be able to do it. <laughs> it's doable. <laughs> That would be cool. Actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thanks. That's all I got. I think that's great. Yep. Thanks. Perfectly great. Yeah. Okay. Next up, ARPA use of proceeds. Michael, you want to address that? So I did send out to you guys the brief. Um, <laughs> it was like 100 pages. I, kind of I read couldn't it. print it. Only, it was too much. Uh, yeah, it's their uh, <laughs> overview of what we can use um, the final rule. It's 44 pages and that's considered the overview of how you can use your ARPA funds. The actual final rule is quite- uh, How much light. do we have? 
So we're going to be receiving approximately half a million dollars in ARPA funds. And a bunch of the um, areas is, you know, there are restrictions on the use and there are different areas that we can. One of the biggest that might be one we want to focus on, especially since we see issues is uh, water, sewer and storm water infrastructure is something that is allowed under the ARPA funding. Um, there are, um, there are some, if, if you have negative in economic impact areas, so, you know, uh, right. from COVID, so those can be assistance to households looking at, are there any ways to provide assistance to small business or nonprofits or aid to impacted in in industries? Obviously, you have to set up the criteria. They have to be able to show that how they were negatively impacted and, and stuff like that. Responding to emergency health emergencies, and uh, there there is available funding for um, obviously protective gear, stuff like that. But right now we're pretty well stocked with those things that are needed. Uh, so far, the only appropriation that you have approved was working with Tritown Health, um, their their initiative, um, which was with us, Lee and Lennox, and it was about $16,000 to the town's ARPA funds. So right now I, I put it out there just to begin the discussion. So we need to start thinking of how are we gonna target this I wanted you guys to just be aware, let those first questions happen, and, mm -hmm. and over the next couple of meetings, start developing a plan on how we're going to use the ARPA funds right. moving forward. How is it that households can... You'd have to show that there's negative income, uh, negative impacts due directly to COVID. Um, so um, how, how we'll set up those, those are the, I'm still reading through everything. Yeah. Uh, the larger <laughs> document, Good luck with that. Uh, trying to learn that, which, yeah. you know, we were able to effectively use $126,000 of CARES fund. Um, one of them was specifically addressing our HVA system over at the library, mm -hmm. which would have originally probably either been a CPC fund request or a possible, um, cause it was for the museum and the rest or, uh, a free cash or uh, funded over at town meeting. Instead, we were able to use the CARES Act to address that need. So similar to that, we, we can look at these, we can figure out, you know, is there a criteria to set up some money to assist if there were households that were specifically impacted to it? But once again, it does have contained where they, they have to show the negative impact and that there is a need. Um, okay. um, question, can I? Yeah. Uh, two questions, actually. Um, one of the things it allows is lost revenue. Yep. So did you quantify how much uh, lost sales and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, occupation, whatever, you know, hotel revenue we lost during the two years of COVID? So looking at, we did not see significant number in loss of well, but if you also if this year you see a significant increase, then you could make the argument that there was a loss based on what it would have been, right. you know, if it if it if it goes up this year. We definitely anticipated a much larger one originally. If you remember a couple of years ago, the the local receipts were very much downplayed and then even last year. I, I do, I just wanted to know, even a couple hundred thousand dollars though is significant. And remember that we raised the, has the 6% increase gone through yet? Uh, all the paperwork was submitted, so I'm not, I'll, I will follow up on that. Okay. Um, Cause that might be another reason why it's going up or it's the same. Right. We have, we'll have to mainly look back at what our historic numbers are, but we yeah. did not see, right. We did not see hundreds. Of, if anything, it'll be in the tens of thousands. Yeah. All right, I'm just saying that that, that yeah. if it, it, because it's allowable, yeah. even if it's fifty grand, that's fifty grand that we don't have to raise and appropriate from taxes, and that's not the worst idea in the world. Right. If if it's allowable to replace that revenue. Right. My second point is that um, all throughout this document, it talks about affordable housing as a presumed impacted class, right. and and um, and uh, just to preview, that's going to be you know uh, you know for funding. For the affordable housing trust uh where it's it's starting out at such a low level compared to what some of the costs would be to actually make a real impact there i think that that's a really great use of proceeds for at least some chunk of this yep mm -hmm. so i think one of the things is is uh if the between the three of you working through me uh we start identifying those ones that you would like to see prioritized then we start looking specifically into the projects we'd like to 
follow through from the overview into the actual mm -hmm. uh, further uh, control documents of what you can use it for. And then if needed, there are, there are officials at the state level, which we did with the library and said, okay, we think this meets criteria. And then we did call them and say, okay, this is where we're looking to fund it. And th their response was, yeah, we'd be able to fund that. So we can um, begin targeting and how we right. want to use this money. And we're a little bit behind, but right. we have two years to use it. And in the next couple of months, we just have to think of how we want to use it. So. Well, I think we should have a conversation with the Sewer and Water Commission yep. as well, because I think that's one big area that we could attack the Elm Street problem. Right. And then one other, that was where we go for. Right. One other question, one other available use of funds is, <laughs> is we can bring, uh, you know, there's, there's two ways to order fast internet. There is individuals can sign up through Spectrum, or you can bring it into a building and then have everybody take part in the building. Uh, you know, for example, you know, like uh, in Lennox, there's a couple of developments to do it this way where they bring in a bigger pipe and then people effectively, you know, get free or subsidized internet if, if they're you know, affordable. We could conceivably bring broadband into Heaton Court and or Pinewoods and, and effectively allow people to save, you know, 100 bucks, 120 bucks each a month on ordering individual service, which might make a really significant impact on the seniors at Heaton Court and and the uh, the uh, the uh, you know the so the see I guess I uh, that one let me look a little further because while it is a improved it's a low income subsidy program infrastructure yeah. right it's right a subsidy but you know. It, yeah, it, and remember, it's funding for a couple of years here, so it's not. No, but if you bring the pipe in with the money, then it costs. Let's say the let's say that for thirty two apartments at at Pinewoods, it's thousand dollars a month. Right. Then you basically charging each person thirty bucks a month. Right. I mean, it's right. not easy, but it right. saves. Right. Right. It could save folks in need a giant amount of money compared to ba basically buying it retail from Spectrum. Right. You know. Right. All right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Chuck? Nope. You good? Okay. And final item on our agenda tonight is um, for us to start. I think it's important for us to start prioritizing objectives as board. Um, and basically, this could be one to five year priorities. Um, and so we've, Mike has been nice enough to compile a list of everything that we've brought together here. And I'm just going to go through it. I'm just going to hit the high points here. I'm going to hit the main categories. We're not going to go into any detail because we'll be fleshing out details um, later. Um, but on this list, and there's no prioritization here, this is just a list of things that we do think are important. Uh, one is housing. Uh, the next one is yeah, infrastructure. Throw it up for you, so you can. Yeah, why don't you pull it up? Okay, housing. Um, so there's a couple of categories under here, but various types of housing, workforce housing, i.e. starter homes and or apartments, elder housing alternatives for aging in place, ADUs, condo homes with services, condos or homes with services and assisted living, um, facilitate independence of seniors and the disabled, um, develop council on aging programs obviously, and uh, ADA compliant environment throughout our business district, which we're working on. Um, mm -hmm. Infrastructure, and I'm not gonna go through all of this, but basically um, there is a real awareness right now and we've been attacking, um, you know, repair to the infrastructure. And I think it's recognized by all of us and certainly by Mike that we have to have um, an ongoing maintenance plan in place. I think you should go through the list, even if it's you just really briefly. It? I mean, okay. I think okay. it's, okay. It, it speaks to, you know. Yeah, Chuck gets tired at night because he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's worked all day. Um, Tuckerman Bridge. So we are proceeding um, with construction design and funding sources right now. Curtisville Bridge, uh, we have to review the status of that. I think it's very important that this board make some kind of a decision to move forward on that. Um, and its historic designation. Um, second Averick Road Bridge, we're applying for a small bridge grant for up to $500,000. Butler Bridge, engineering assessment, is that ongoing? Yeah. Okay, playgrounds, um, we wanna be ADA compliant, obviously park improvements, which we've touched upon. 
the salt shed at the highway department. Uh, we know we're gonna have to replace that. So engineering and design is being done. Uh, highway equipment, large truck and equipment, um, cemetery restoration, which we just had a cemetery um, commission meeting. So we're moving forward with that. Uh, Glendale Fire Station, which was mentioned this evening uh, also, and stormwater and there are issues with stormwater on Elm Street, uh, which the Sewer and Water Commission has um, discussed. In progress right now, we have the Larry Wog Bridge. And so we just have the punch, the final paving to complete the final punch list uh, in the springtime. Averick Road, that will be completed in spring of 2022. Just the bridge. Inventory in progress with MVP. So we heard from Allison. Um, that was fascinating. <clears throat> the pump station replacement. RFP has been released in the bids are due in February. So all this is ongoing, but again, the major categories so far are housing and infrastructure. Um, we also have next, natural resources stewardship. Another, I think a very important um, consideration for most residents of Stockbridge is really stewarding our natural resources and make, making sure that we're taking care of them. Um, by the SBSC and with the help of the SBA. Uh, right now, we know that we're gonna have an issue with the water chestnuts, uh, which have invaded. Um, there is project that will have to go on with the state for the state boat ramp. Um, obviously, we're addressing Ice Glen, Campusa Bog, um, forest management and watershed protection. Mm -hmm. So the hemlock tree treatment is in progress. RFP released in February, will be released in February and uh, treatment will begin spring 2022. And dredging, the final design is in progress right now. Um, next major category is economic revitalization, expanding the downtown public parking. And I think we should really look at the development of the industrial park. Mm -hmm. which is kind of sat idle and unused. It's privately owned. So, it's, privately you know, owned I think. it's privately owned, but that doesn't mean we can't have conversations. Mm -hmm. so, We've been uh, approached to you. Okay. Expansion of public utilities. Um, so we need to be planning for the future um, as well. So the long range future. And I think that we start to have to start anticipating what kind of expansions are we going to be looking at and what would we like to do and let's plan now for what might happen five or 10 years down the road. Um, so for both sewer and water. Um, improved communication with residents. Um, we've talked about this before, um, doing some kind of a website update, make it more user friendly. Um, and we've also discussed um, between Michael and myself, automated dissemination of meeting minutes, which is being done in Lenox right now. Um, I think it's semi-automated. I think yeah. there's human intervention, but I think it would be worth looking into. Um, engender community cohesiveness. Uh, incentivize younger families to live in Stockbridge. We know that a healthy community has many generations. We need more children. We need more younger people here. Um, <clears throat> and I think we could probably do something to develop community activities. Um, and my big question is, we have a senior center and why do we call it the senior center? Can we call it the community center to possibly encourage its use by more people? Um, so yeah. that's something we can talk about. <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> another 10, another million here. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, just change New sign off. <laughs> well, I have to laugh because my spinning guild is meeting there once every two weeks right now. And that's not a and senior And one meeting? of the women joked that her, when she said she was going to the Stockbridge Senior Center, he gave her the hairy eyeball, like, <laughs> we're going where? So mm -hmm. I said, you know, it could mm -hmm. be just called the community center. Mm -hmm. Um, Chuck's mentioned this in the past, and we've discussed it in the past, outdoor pavilion to host community events. Um, another big topic is increased affordability for residents. So we will be looking at on the warrant, um, tax exemptions, deferrals, et cetera. Um, one thing I would like Mike to pursue that I know he's familiar with is investigate the community choice power supply program. 
which I sent you a copy of what they have in Lennox, and they've done it in Great Barrington, I think, too. And it's actually the Berkshire County one. Yeah. That's the one he did, yeah. I wrote. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know the Stockbridge yeah. decided uh, six years ago not to join. <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> well, it would be, and just for the public, let me see somewhere I have it written down. Hmm, I was stuck in the two. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know why. But I was going to have the Mass General Law here, but now I don't see it. Um, just so, but anyway, Mike can explain that maybe in a future meeting because mm -hmm. we want to go over this quickly. Um, uh, the residential exemption, obviously, that's still on the table. Um, senior work, can we increase that to 1500? Uh, next big category, preserve the history of Stockbridge. So develop a historical information plan to preserve and capitalize on our rich history. Um, oral and video recordings is one idea. Um, obviously, what we just discussed earlier for CPC request was um, doing some kind of public historic locale information. Um, archival preservation of our town records, which there might be a possibility um, that we could get some assistance mm -hmm. um, on that from a Norman Rockwell based on a previous conversation I've had with them. Um, in progress, we're working on the cat and dog fountain. Um, CPC funds estimated to be completed spring 2022. Basin issue is to be resolved. Do we know when that'll be resolved? No, that's the one caveat <laughs> on that. Just project. use the pre cash for that. I mean, can we just like we get could. it done? Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the issue with the basin? I mean, it's got to be placed the, underneath the basin. All the brick had deteriorated to the point that the, it's going to have the basin itself is going to have to be completely. Um, so we done. Why are we doing there are it? pieces with it. Well, we're working on it. And <laughs> Capstones will all stay. Capstones yeah. will stay, and the rest. And in order, you still need to have design before the project. So right now, we're just having a little difficulty you know, locking this down. So, but what, I am working with the committee on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Soldiers Monument, i.e., also known as the Civil War Monument, but appropriately and correctly called the Soldiers Monument, RFP to be issued late winter 2022. Um, the work will be done summer through fall of 2022. We already have the, that's already in place. We already, we already started we that work. At least the RFP for the actual work, we had the funds already available. Yeah, yeah but they, the, the engineer you know, came in and they did the test and right. now we have to and evaluate it. Done. We have to do the actual finished work, option one. Right. right. But isn't that vendor selected? What? Isn't that vendor selected? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they did the grout evaluation. The end. All right. So, then, so you're saying this is a different project than the grout evaluation? And right, right. Okay. So now we're actually okay. putting out the RP to do the finished work right. that was based up on Sorry. condition option one. Uh, spoke to her today. She's within the next couple of weeks. She's going to get the. Um, the specifications for the bid proposal, and then I'll put together the bid proposal. We'll have it out with a hope to have the work done if we can select a vendor for summer and fall of 2022. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the Chime Tower, RFP spring of 2022, work to be completed in fall of 2022 to the spring of 2023. Um, and then another major consideration is school projects, um, you know. It remains to be seen what the impact of the town is going to be, but we have to start anticipating it. Oh, absolutely, and, and there may be a there may be a district merger that is going to be come to town meeting vote. You know, it's a not you know there's a lot of work on and the on the question of new high school and timing and you know merger and everything. Um, and if there's anything else you guys would like to, yeah, yeah, a lot. see added. <laughs> so I, I, I just I had a couple of. All, Important places to focus, you know. Attention. Every one of them are. Yeah. I think that it's important that we frame uh, water and sewer as much on maintenance and and repair as on expansion. You know, uh, you're just talking to Mike, you know, uh, just in general, I know he's not sewer, but we were talking about the sewer the other day and he was talking about the two foot sections in the 1880s when they were built and mm -hmm. they're concrete and how we had infiltration in some days with all the rain last year of a million gallons a day. And, you know, we're going to need to reline those and 
you know, and, and a lot of folks legitimately, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't mean to, you know, uh, uh, editorialize. A lot of folks have, have talked about expansion of, of sewer. I think it's really important also that we talk about, you know, modernizing 150 year old infrastructure where we need to because we can't have a million gallons of gray water going through the system. I'm not saying we are every day, but he just threw that number out. Yes. No, yes. We, do, we, yes. Do. we know it is still operating. The numbers aren't yeah. right, Michael. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. You know, the, uh, the, uh, but we know we have existing issues yes. down the streets. Yes. And I'll just put it this way. I think it's extremely important mm -hmm. that, um, for instance, you would not build an addition on your house if your roof was leaking. You would be repairing the roof. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the situation that we're in. And I kind of think mm -hmm. that the Water and Sewer Commission um, takes that attitude. So mm -hmm. it's not right. that sewer and water expansion wouldn't happen, but it it may have to take a back seat to that's actually what I'm saying taking care of an existing problem right. that could become right. a lot right. worse. Now, another minor note, but if you're talking about automated dissemination of meeting minutes, one easy to execute and significant improvement over the Linux system would be to give the user who puts their in their email address the ability to put in comma delineated keywords. So for example, I live on Hawthorne Street. Stop by, say hello. Um, if I could put in Hawthorne, then any meeting minutes and or any meeting agenda that includes the word Hawthorne would automatically be sent to me. It's really easy. We don't have to go into the details. Okay. Tonight. All right. That's <laughs> okay. Um, that um, work with you, Patrick, on website yeah, okay. design. Uh, 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 wait, then let me just see if I anything else. else Never, no project <laughs> so what I was going to say is over the next, <laughs> between now and our next meeting, um, if the board would like to, if there's any additional things you think needed to be added to this list. Then the other thing I would recommend, because I saw this happen when we did the MVP up in North Adams, and I'm not sure if we did it here, but if you color code it, and actually I, I did it on the ADA when I was working for the city and we had to come up with a plan, and we did it around the same thing, a one, three, five year plan, is that you color code it by green, yellow, and red. So you identify, highlight, and get it back to me, if you would highlight all the ones you think should happen within the next year, the ones in yellow that should happen within the next three years. So it's one, one three, and five months. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Yeah. Uh, and then the things that can be pushed out look to the five years. Look at a project we have passed two and, years ago. We're still getting yeah. it on the table. So, and, and obviously, if you could get that back to me, I can compile it and then bring it back to you, and we can look at how we grade things and then develop this. You know, okay. look, it's really important that this is a great list and, and so much of it is already going on, which I think is really you know, a testament to a lot of people in this town's hard work. I think I think you need to kind of also, you know, make sure that I mean, you've made the point to me privately and I'm sure to everyone else about how having fewer projects that actually get completed is more important than having a long laundry list where we can kind of put out our best ideas. And I know I'm guilty of that the way other people are, um, maybe more so, but so I would appreciate it if also beyond us kind of giving you our priorities, you give us a reality check of, cause we know that we're doing triage yes. and some, we know we got to do those. And then how much more can the system handle before nothing gets done? So what I would do is take your list and I have my uh, four meetings that I have monthly. I have a finance group meeting. I have a public work group meeting. I have a public safety group meeting. And then I have a town hall staff group meeting. And I would take your ideas and run them past everybody um, that are part of my team to say, okay, here's what we're doing, guys. How can, which one, how, how realistic is it? Can we get to all these? Can't we? Can we? And then, like I said, I, right, I've expressed that, that I would rather see the projects coming in and off the board instead of just lining the board with a million and one projects. So, um, well, yeah. we got a lot <clears throat> being done. Just uh, takes forever to complete them. <laughs> but I want everybody to remember that like these major headings are still, these are areas of focus that I think we yeah. always should be addressing in this town. And there will always be different projects that are associated with them. And there's always going to be a timeline for all those projects. And some of these things may go out five or 10 years. Right. Yeah. So anyway, do we have any comments or questions from the public? Any hands up, Mike? Where do we not online? Where do we stand? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, not online, but I do have something I'd like to say. So when you finish that talk. All right. I have a, a Patty Kaya. 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 Sorry. Patty Kaya. 
Hi, this is, um, I'm sorry that my comment is from so long ago, but um, this is the first time you've asked uh, four comments since it came up. So in the, um, the community preservation funding, I was wondering if um, there's been any discussion of adding some kayak racks to the beach. There's always like an enormous demand for the racks. And also um, from my experience uh, talking to other towns, for example, Monterey has kayak racks that are for um, sort of the same width as the ones we have, but also they have ones that are more appropriate for people who have two kayaks or a canoe, which the um, two kayaks kind of blurp over the side of the kayak rack. So anyway, this is from so many minutes ago, so I apologize. Um, oh, no problem, no problem. No, that and Parks and Recreation, um, I believe are talking about adding a second kayak rack at the beach. A third, right. Or a third, yeah, a third. A, yeah, an additional, third. yeah, an additional rack. So yes, they have discussed that. And we are examining an alternate site to have additional racks right. at the beach, but we're not sure Right, we right. have to, yeah, feasible. we're looking at the feasibility of having also a second site where you could access a kayak rack and, and enter the water with it, but we have to make sure that it's feasible and safe before that mm -hmm. would proceed. Yeah. Uh, so if I wanted to follow this issue, would the best um, approach be to attend any meeting that's about community preservation funds? Mm -hmm. Is that yes, the best? Yesterday we had a problem with our Zoom vendor, you know, just uh, they, their system was down. So people weren't able to get into the meeting. Well, we had four or five nonprofits who came in person and we conducted that part of the meeting there and I recorded it. And we're having a follow up meeting for the Zoom that will be uh, this Tuesday at 4 p.m. So I apologize that we had some technical difficulties. They were uh, kind of beyond our control because I know that you were thinking of coming. I on. would say that the discussions that the discussion of expansion and additional racks and changing the racks and that would happen at the park and rec committee level. Right. Well, so yeah, I mean, I'm just I was addressing the CPC because she was on trying to get in yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also on a very related note, and I'm sorry, I don't actually understand quite how the budgeting works. So the parks and rec committee has actually. Um, saved some money in the past two pandemic summers because of the, the lack of lifeguards. And I'm just curious, did that money get reallocated toward Park Rec Act, um, initiatives or did that just get rolled back into the general fund? So uh, close out at the end of the year, the funds restore back into the general funds, um, including salaries can't be, uh, re can't, don't get moved into expenses. They would just be used for additional salaries. So. Um, those those funds from the previous years have have gone away. So all right, yeah. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Anyone else with their hand up out there? Nope. No, Anita. Thank you. How do you see the hand up? Hmm? What? Didn't see the hand up. Yeah, it comes up in the corner up there, but I can see it. Yeah, it's like in the back. Hard to see. Screen. It's easier on my screen to see it. Great setup. Um, can I take this off? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. better. I can hear you much better now. Um, good evening. <laughs> so, this is basically the. Um, oh, I'm Anita Schwerner, and I'm the chairperson of the. Stafford's Democratic Town Committee, and I'm speaking on their behalf tonight. So um, basically it is the same letter that was sent to the select board and Michael Canales and- um, Today. Today. Oh, received it yes. today, and I was gonna mention Roxanne to place it on the agenda for the next meeting. Okay. Because we have not seen it. We can't seen. take action on it. We have not seen the letter. We have to see the letter, we haven't yeah. seen the letter. Right. Um, so it's about Governor Baker's mandate that all public meetings have a remote component is set to expire April 1st, 2022. At the January 22nd, 2022 meeting of the Stockbridge Democratic Town Committee last Saturday, a motion was passed to request that the select board support an article on the upcoming town warrant requiring that all public meetings in Stockbridge have a remote component. We ask also that the select board include an item on its next meeting agenda to discuss our proposal 
and vote on supporting a warrant article that requires the continuation of hybrid and remote meetings. At our meeting, we discussed the importance of transparency in local government, as well as the value of hybrid and remote meetings in enabling an informed electorate. Although the need for hybrid meetings came as a response to COVID-19, the ability to watch and participate in meetings in real time, as well as to access them anytime on CTSB TV, uh, streaming or TV, has been widely embraced by the residents of Stockbridge, both, both full and part-time. At the July 15th Select Board hybrid meeting, the second homeowners stated that remote meetings are extremely valuable for them and they appreciate being able to participate in town meetings. They ask that the Zoom option be continued to enable them to attend more town board and committee meetings, which are held during the week. Meetings with the remote option have the advantage of enabling participation from home or anywhere in the world. The availability of Zoom meetings has increased participation among residents and members of the public who find it difficult to attend in person due to a wide variety of reasons, including harsh winter weather, inability to travel, illness or concern over exposure to illness, and conflicts with work or family obligations. So as a first step, the members of the Stockbridge Democratic Town Committee ask that the select board place an item on their next uh, meeting agenda so that they can discuss and vote on supporting the requested warrant article. And I thank you for your consideration. Okay, well, Anita, we will do that. Thank you for your consideration. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, as you know, it's just been so successful. And this is really impressive setup. Uh, I'd yeah. like to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Any question? Thank you. No. Thank you. Have a good day. You Thanks, too. Anita. Thanks. Thank you. Motion adjourned? Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank for you. See you later.